This is Kick-Ass News. I'm Ben Mathis. Today's episode is brought to you by Kronos. Kronos provides HR solutions for the modern workforce and the people who support, motivate, and engage them. They put HR, payroll, talent, and timekeeping on a single cloud-based platform. Learn more about Kronos HR Payroll Talent and Time at kronos.com slash hrswagger. That's kronos.com slash hrswagger. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Ben Mathis. Welcome to Kick-Ass News. When suspense author Dean Koontz first began writing professionally, his literary agent told him he'd never be a best-selling author. Then, when his novel hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list, his agent told him he'd never again have a number one bestseller. Not one to be underestimated, Dean Koontz has now had 14 number one bestsellers, so he was a little skeptical when many in the traditional publishing community tried to discourage him from signing a five-book deal with online retail giant Amazon. But as he explains today, he's grown surprisingly more risk-tolerant in his recent years, and he believes that Amazon's innovative way of marketing and promoting books is the wave of the future in publishing. He discusses his first offering through Amazon, a collection of six short stories titled Nameless, why creating an anti-hero with no memory and no identity appealed to him, and what Nameless has to say about the blessing and the curse of technology in our lives. Then Dean reveals the meticulous research that goes into his writing, how much of himself he puts into his books, why he always writes with the blinds closed, and how his love of dogs always seems to make it into his work. Coming up with the master of suspense, best-selling author Dean Koontz, in just a moment. Koontz is the author of 14 number one New York Times bestsellers. His books have sold over 500 million copies worldwide, a figure that increases by more than 17 million copies per year, and his work is published in 38 languages. Now he's out with an Amazon original collection of short thrillers titled Nameless, which is available for free to Prime and Kindle Unlimited members. Dean Koontz, welcome. Thanks for having me here. Half a billion books. That's pretty amazing, I have to say. How many years have you been writing now? Oh, wow. I guess I uh, full-time since uh, 69 Mm -hmm. and uh, part-time before that. I started selling when I was a senior in college. Wow. And uh, when after I I married in 66, and after a couple of years uh, teaching school, I didn't want to be doing that anymore. I wasn't making a living with writing, but my wife said, I'll support you for five years, and if you can't make it in five years, you'll never make it. Uh, I tried to negotiate up to seven, but she has Sicilian <laughs> blood, so she wins every negotiation. And uh, so I've been at it full-time uh, ever since. When did you first decide that you wanted to be a writer? Was this early in your childhood or when? You know, uh, I grew up in a house with no books. In fact, mm-hmm. books were considered a waste of time. Really? Uh, and I was encouraged uh, not to read books, but to learn things like how to repair a car. Huh. But when I was eight years old, I was already writing stories on tablet paper, drawing little covers, binding the edge with staples, and peddling to, to relatives for a nickel. So <laughs> I was agent, writer, publisher, and bookseller all huh. in one. That's interesting. So for you, books were sort of a forbidden fruit in your household. Really? uh, We were very poor. My Mm -hmm. dad held 44 jobs in 34 years because he frequently Mm -hmm. punched out the boss. Not a good (laughs) career move. (laughs) Uh, And he had serious alcohol problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as a consequence, books were an escape. when I read, it not only lifted me out of that and I could get caught up in story, but it also showed me there were other ways to live than this. When you're, when you're a child and you tend to think every house is like this when the doors are closed, sure. but by reading books, you find out that isn't the case. Yeah. Now, when you were young, who were the writers that you admired? Who were you drawn to? Well, I think the first book I ever remember 
was uh, Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows, which huh. I read several times because I identified with Mr. Toad and uh, the wild Mr. Toad. And uh, <laughs> Are you that wild? <laughs> not that wild, but I think I wanted to be. Yeah. Uh, and or just uh, a bad driver? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a good driver. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the uh, then as I got slightly older, I, I gravitated towards science fiction, mm-hmm. and it was Ray Bad- Bradbury, Robert Heinlein, Theodore Sturgeon, sure. that whole group of that period. You mentioned a moment ago uh, that you spent some time teaching, I think, in high school before mm-hmm. you became a professional writer or, or, or before you could live off of your writing, I guess we should say. Uh, did you like teaching? I actually enjoyed teaching. I didn't enjoy the bureaucracy. Really? And it was yeah. – it's worse now than it was then. Yeah. Uh, you had to answer for every little thing you wanted to do. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was willing to teach them silence, Silas Marner in ninth grade. But yeah. once we got done with that, I wanted to teach them something that was more fun to read. Mm-hmm. And I would get called on the carpet for that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. You were always supposed to go by the book, and there was always the forms to fill out, and the paperwork right. got ever greater. And I finally said, you know, I like teaching. I like the kids. I'm still in touch with some kids I taught who are now retired, which yeah. seems very strange. But uh, uh, but I just couldn't stand the bureaucracy. Yeah. So that's why I had to make that leap. Yeah, I imagine that you were probably better read than the people who came up with the approved syllabus. And that must be very constricting <laughs> as it, an English teacher. Uh, it, terribly so. Uh, I think some teachers have broken through now and mm-hmm. do teach things outside the syllabus. But it was something not done then, and uh, so I was always butting heads against the wall. Yeah. And, uh, and I've got a very hard head, but uh, <laughs> sometimes the wall was winning, so I decided to give up on it. Yeah, and I read that at a certain point when you were first starting out as a writer, uh, I guess you had had an agent who told you you would never be a best-selling writer. Did you get a lot of rejection in those early days? Oh, my, yeah. Uh, uh, that happened even after the rejections had stopped. Oh, really? huh. uh, I had gotten – he was my second agent. The first agent was a crook. We will not use his name, and I had to get out of there. And my second agent was not a crook. He was a wonderful guy, and we got along great. But I – and I was selling mid-list books. Uh, and I started sending him outlines for things that I wanted to pitch to publishers. And he kept rejecting them, and I finally said – why are you rejecting these? He said, that's when he said, because these are too ambitious. You'll always huh. be a successful mid-list writer, but you'll never be a bestseller. And I was like 26 years old. I said, wow. I can't be looking at the rest of my life exactly where I am now. And he said, I'm really going to hate to see you go because we've we become friends. But I would be very sad on this day if I didn't know that a year from now you'll be back and say, you were right. I should never have thought I could do this. Huh. Well, it took a lot more than a year to become a bestseller, but I never did go back. But he and I still occasionally correspond or oh, talk really? on the phone. And no kidding. It's uh, He knows he made a mistake. Yeah, he made a multi-million dollar mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, I know that also earlier in your career, uh, I think it was either your agents or your editors discouraged you from branching out of horror and suspense to other genres, things like sci-fi. I think that you said that they warned of quote unquote negative crossover. And supposedly that's part of the reason that you've written under various pen names at times in your career. Do you think that readers today are a lot more forgiving of genre crossing? I I think they are, but I think they always were. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were prevented from doing it out of the common wisdom of publishing. <laughs> and the thing about the term common wisdom is it's common, but it isn't wisdom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's the things they think are true, but they don't really understand why they think that. I Some critics have said I created the cross-genre novel, and certainly when I started doing it, I don't, wasn't aware of it, and I took a lot of heat for it. Publishers like you to do the same thing again and again and again. Right. If you wrote one book about bricklayers, they want you to do a whole series about bricklayers. <laughs> and uh, so I just couldn't do that. I have to entertain myself sitting there, and I've got a low boredom threshold. So uh, I started – now it's called mashups and other terms, but I started doing those crossovers. And I took a lot of heat. Initially, they said, well, this is different. You must put it under a pen name. And I kept doing that and realized this was self-defeating. And what I felt was true, and I think time has proved it, 
is what readers respond to is the author's voice, his way of seeing the world and the way he uses the language. And whether you're writing a story that's a straight-out suspense novel or one that has an edge of the supernatural, or if it's got a love story as important as a suspense, they'll roll with that if it's still in your voice. Mm -hmm. And that's what seems to have been the case all these years. Now, you recently signed a five-year book deal with Amazon, and this latest is Nameless, which is part of that deal, or, or I guess the, the, the deal is for the novels, and this is sort of ancillary to that. And it's weird because I don't usually think of Amazon as a publisher. I think of them as this online book retailer that's turned into so much more and a million other things. What gave you the confidence to move from, say, a more traditional publishing house to this global giant? Um. I had done several uh, what are called e-singles, novelettes, mm -hmm. or whatnot uh, that my regular publisher published, and they had succeeded. But I noticed that the reason they succeeded was they were selling through Amazon, hmm. and uh, the regular publisher didn't have that marketing channel there. And Amazon came to me and asked me to write one directly for them. That was a novelette called Ricochet Joe. It did very well. And then they said, could you create a series with the same character and we sell them digitally and as audios? And I was intrigued because regular publishers don't want the shorter work. But there, right. there's a lot in that format that's fun to do that you can't do in a novel. And so I said, yes, I would do it. And I wrote these six uh, stories called Nameless. And uh, in the course of doing that, I found I was dealing with a lot of fun to deal with efficient people who were very creative. And I was having no trouble with my former publisher, except times change, and sometimes there's a desire not to change with them. And I was feeling we were bumping up against a wall there, and I had to make a move. Mm -hmm. So my agent's Took me to market. Sounds like I'm a pig about to go be slaughtered. <laughs> yeah. He took me to market, and we got eight offers. And he insisted that we should go to Amazon because they do publish hardcovers, trade paperbacks, uh, audios, and all the rest. And they have for a long time been moving in on publishers' ground. And I said, well, I won't be sold in Barnes & Noble now. And there are certain things because they feel oh, they're interesting. Too, too competitive. They, huh. There's a sort of resentment against Amazon. He said, my suspicion is you're going to sell a lot more books than you currently sell through a mainstream publisher. And so we got eight offers, and one of them was Amazon's. Financially, it was very good. What was more interesting was everybody gave you a marketing plan. Nobody compared with Amazon's. Oh, really? It was like... Oh. It's nameless stories, which I'd already written for them. The book contract came later. Oh, okay. Um, but now the what they are doing with nameless, the series of stories, is probably three times more promotion and publicity hmm. than I've ever had for a novel. No kidding. And it was that that made me realize times are changing, and maybe yeah. this will be interesting now. When I did this, I thought I was going to get a lot of negative feedback from people I dealt with in publishing over the years, former editors, uh, uh, former publishers, uh, friends who are booksellers. Why? Have, because of because they're short stories or because it's only available uh, digitally? Or, or? Well, the stories are only digital, available digitally. The novels right. will right, be right, available right, right. in novels. But because it was Amazon and some booksellers mm -hmm. like Barnes & Noble feel they're a competitor and don't want anything to sure. do with what Amazon publishes. But instead, every response I got was positive. And huh. one after another said, you have done the right thing. Things are changing, and our business isn't recognizing it, but Amazon does. And so far, this has been very interesting. Nameless Stories just got released today, free to all Prime members. The novels start on the 31st of March with a novel titled Devoted. And it's interesting to watch and see how this will unfurl. If I was 50, you know, I would have probably been too cocky to make the change. <laughs> but as I got older, I say, why not? I've been around a long time. Things have been very successful. And I'm getting kind of bored. So let's try <laughs> something new. That's interesting. That's kind of a, uh, the opposite of what I assume happens when you get older. You know, usually you assume that people get more set in their ways than the old way. <laughs> I've... 
I've always run into problems. Uh, it wasn't just that second agent I had who told mm-hmm. me I'd never be a bestseller. When I was publishing at Putnam, my publisher resisted. I was selling in paperback, and she first told me, you'll always be doing well in paperback. You'll never be a hardcover bestseller. Huh. And grindingly, we sold more, but almost with the resistance of the publisher, book by book, until one day she called me up and said, midnight, which you always learn you're going to be on the New York Times, I said, it's 10 days ahead because they publish the book review section separately. And she said, you're going to be number one on the New York Times with midnight. Before I could say whoopee, uh, (laughs) she said, but I want you to understand something. This will never happen for you again (laughs) because you don't write the kind of books that can be number one. Wow. We had four more number ones, and every single time I was told, you'll (laughs) never be number one again. And that was the first time I said, okay, I've got to make a change. Um, And that change eventually worked out very well. Yeah. but there's always been this resistance that I've always found hard to understand. I've been told you can't be number one because your vocabulary is too big. There is this <laughs> attitude in really? New York that has a very down-the-nose look at readers out past the Hudson River, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, I get most of my intelligent mail from the heartland and anywhere, uh, small towns, big towns, whatever. So I don't think you know, that attitude doesn't serve publishing well. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways it's kind of Amazon getting back to its roots now because people probably forget these days that they started out as the online bookseller. Yes. So they're in some ways they're kind of giving back to them that brought them to the dance, as they say. <laughs> and I'm interested in what you were talking about, the marketing of it, because I noticed that they use terms like bingeability and describe these short stories as quick hits. It, it almost sounds like they're thinking of this more in the way that one rolls out and digests a podcast or a streaming TV series. One of the great things about I, I call they call them sh- shorter pieces. I call mm-hmm. them novelettes. They're anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand words long, and uh, the six of them together are almost novel length. And uh, I th- I saw it as the challenge of giving you the experience of a novel with a lot of excitement, color, strong character, all within a condensed format that would be like binge watching TV. Mm-hmm. Once you read the first, you want to read all the rest of them. Bang, bang, bang. And uh, they, Amazon started referring to it as season one. If this goes <laughs> well, we might have a season two of Nameless. And I've started thinking that way myself. So I, if, if it works, I know where Nameless will go next. But. Yeah. And I mean, really, if it weren't for companies like Amazon and new technology embracing short fiction, it might not exist anymore. I mean, I can't think of any magazines that still print short stories anymore and certainly not any mainstream magazines like, I don't know, Collier's and Saturday Evening Post from the old days. This really fills that niche, these uh, Amazon original stories. And there used to be great stuff published in that. Some of my favorite stories are are that kind of thing. Um, and not just uh, little crime stories and things, but the turn of the screw or all the Sherlock Holmes sure. or many, many other things were done at that kind of length. Um, and it, it's just appealing to me. Now I love the novel length and I'm going – I've already delivered two complete novels to Amazon Publishing. Uh, so I'll keep doing that. But these were a great deal of fun. I'm curious, do you approach a novel differently than you approach, say, a series of short stories? I think there are six in this one. How, uh, my assumption would be that it would be easier to write a series of short stories than a novel, but I don't really know that to be true. Well, it's easier and it's harder. Yeah. Uh, the easier part is you sit down for a novel in maybe six months. You never know. Uh, if it's a very long novel, mm-hmm. quarter of a million words, you'll be a year on it. I have 60, 70 hour weeks. If it's shorter, wow. it'll be six months. Uh, with a story like this, sometimes two weeks, sometimes four weeks, uh, but that's a short and near horizon. And you sit down every day knowing you're getting nearer the end than you'll ever be at this point in a novel. Yeah. And that's very happy making. But uh, the hard part of it is when you're writing the same character and you've created this world th- that he's living in uh, – nameless and he's doing these amazing things he's bringing i wouldn't call it justice but he's bringing bringing the truth to bad people who've done very bad things and he makes them suffer for the truth of what they've done um 
you could get stale with that. It could be just a little too one trick pony and you could go. So it demands that you get very creative in what each of these episodes essentially is about. And then that there has to be some thread of meaning that he's moving to and some mm -hmm. revelation toward the end of, let's say, season one. Mm -hmm. So it makes you think in a more compact, interesting way. So that becomes harder the more you write of them. You get to story four and you think, uh-oh, this has got to be a lot different than stories one, two, and three. Yeah. Uh, and so that's where the harder part comes in. And you mentioned this main character, Nameless. Uh, he's called Nameless because he literally has no name. He has amnesia and doesn't remember who he is. Uh, what was the appeal for you as a writer of writing a main character that has no identity and no past? Uh, that's certainly – there's been characters in suspense fiction and mainstream mm -hmm. fiction that have amnesia. And I thought it's a that's a kind of tired concept. How do you do it differently? I knew I wanted it to be somebody who was sort of on the road, who was moving from one event to the other and had been doing this for two years and had full recollection of what he had done in two years, but no idea of who he was, where he had come from, or why he was doing this. And then it suddenly dawned on me uh, before I started story one that how to handle it differently was that the amnesia would not be an accident. You know, it would not be a, a, a growth out of any illness. Yeah. He would come to the realization that he wanted the amnesia and it has been technologically engineered. Now, who engineered it and why? And he thinks he asked for this. And part of his appeal for a story for me is he ends up in a town in Texas and he's got a reservation that's been prepaid in a motel under another name. So he gets an email that tells him to go to that hotel. Parked in front of his unit is the car he's to use for this. In the car is a suitcase full of clothes and, and a lot of money. Everything he needs is supplied for him wherever he goes, but he has no idea by whom or why. And the mystery of that fascinated me. Yeah, yeah. He has no possessions even. No. That's yeah. what he's given. And he's sort of forced to live entirely in the moment as a result of that. And yet he also has this gift or affliction. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, depending on how you look at it, it's a gift or affliction where he sees visions from the past and perhaps sometimes even visions from the future. Is the concept of time sort of fungible for Nameless? To an extent it is. It's mm -hmm. like that as, as quantum physics tells us, all time is present at that moment, past, present, and future, is here from the moment of the Big Bang. And we don't go into that too much in the story, but he sort of lives in that philosophy. Mm -hmm. And these little glimpses of the visions that he get, he's never sure if he's seeing something from his engineered amnesia, some bit of his past breaking through, yeah. or whether he's seeing something that's forthcoming. Sometimes he's clear that it's something forthcoming. And he does. He thinks this must be an accidental side effect of the engineered amnesia, and he's essentially right about that. So it doesn't make his life easier. It makes it a little harder because he doesn't know mm -hmm. the meaning. Uh, and by the time you get to the end of the first series, it gets real complicated because yeah. he's yeah. seeing something that maybe is part past and part future, and he has to figure yeah. out which is which. And technology figures heavily into these stories. The group that Nameless works for is able to hack into government records, uh, people's GPS, create deep fake videos, override household security systems, and manipulate smart home tech. Is there a little bit of a warning in here about all the technology that we've let into our lives now? You know, I before this, I, read, I wrote five books with the same character, Jane Hawk. And those books are very high in technology, and I was driven to write them because I was reading books in which the characters were supposedly off the grid, and I knew they weren't. I could think of a dozen ways that you could find any of them if you wanted to. And I thought, I'd like the challenge of really writing a character for whom the entire government in the United States is looking, that she is a rogue FBI agent, the most wanted on the top 10 most wanted list, and yet nobody can find her. And... That was one of the most challenging research jobs I ever had to do. And when I finished it, I had all this knowledge in my yeah. head that was there and you couldn't shake out. So some of that come, gets into the nameless stories too. And it was fun to have that. In, in, in the Jane Hawk books, she's operating against all of that. 
in his case, he's got a group on his side that can do all of that technologically, and it mm-hmm. gives him an advantage. Yeah, and it's sort of taken for granted that Nameless or whoever he works for are out to do right, but that's a lot of power to put into the hands of a shadowy organization that operates outside of the law. We can certainly imagine how the combination of vigilante justice and unlimited technological resources could lead to bad ends in the wrong hands and have. We're heading into a very strange future. And Mm -hmm. and when we say it's out of the hands of law enforcement, well, we also know law enforcement doesn't always enforce the law. Right. Uh, And so this technology in any hands is getting more and more dangerous. Um, One thing I like to say about these stories, he's not strictly a vigilante. Uh, he own the problems with vigilantes is they operate totally out of emotion, right? And they sometimes go after the wrong people. In this case, he absolutely knows these people did it. They have them to rights, but the system won't prosecute them because they're either too powerful, they're too well connected, or they're too clever, um, uh, or they just for one reason or another evade mm-hmm. the law. Uh, so what I've said in these stories, he's not bringing justice to the victim so much because justice is a fungible concept. It Mm -hmm. changes by culture. It changes by time. Uh, But what he's bringing is the truth. Uh, He he, and all these researchers behind him know the truth of the situation, and he brings the truth of it, reveals it in a way that forces the bad guys sometimes actually to do themselves in, in one way or another, and how he manages to do that. He sometimes has to commit violence against them, and sometimes they can take care of themselves because of how he manipulates them into it, and that's a lot of fun to try to pull off. Yeah, and that makes me think of the third story in the series, uh, which has certain elements of the supernatural, and it kind of reminded me a lot of the Telltale Heart. (laughs) Are you heavily influenced by Edgar Allan Poe? Not heavily. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the one story I always loved was Murder in the Room Morgue. Oh, yeah. Uh, because it's so creepy, this trained ape. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah what a bizarre ending. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite a and, twist. Uh, but I loved Poe's poetry, uh, and uh, I've probably have long been inspired by that. Uh, but I have read in every genre, and I consider it literary fiction another genre. Uh, I know uh, that would be considered beneath the pale to say that, but it's absolutely true. There's good work in every genre, um, and... I read, I've always read in everything. It's one of the reasons I got impatient about writing within one genre and started doing these sort of mashups where you get a little bit of something fresh and hopefully original in it. Yeah, I read somewhere, I think on your website, that you read up to 200 books a year. Is that right? That used to be right. Okay. As I've got busier and busier, I don't read quite so much. Yeah. But when I'd say for the first 20 years we were married, my wife and I each read at least 200 books a year. Wow. And uh, that was invaluable for a young writer mm-hmm. because you saw all kind of techniques that you w- wouldn't have seen if you read strictly in literary fiction or strictly in science fiction or strictly in mystery suspense. And you started seeing all these other techniques, all these other approaches, and that gives you a lot deeper ocean of of yeah craft to draw from. And I know that a lot of your books are heavily researched. Did you also read a lot of nonfiction as well? You know, this is revelatory. When I was in high school and college, I hated reading that kind of thing oh, yeah? <laughs> to do reports. So I would fake it. I would, huh. they would give you a subject. I would write about it, but I would not research it. I would, <laughs> really? I would create the names of all the books that I used as my source material <laughs> and the names of the writers, and I'd assign it to Doubleday or to Knopf or to whoever. And I never got caught. Never, uh, got, caught. never got caught throughout <laughs> high school and college. So that made it very quick to write papers on things and I yeah. write what I thought about the subject and then cite <laughs> all these funny sources. And that gave me a lot of time to read things I wanted to read. Uh, and I look back on it and think, I don't recommend this to the young people out there, but yeah. you know, it worked for me. <laughs> well, you must have really written with authority if you got away with it. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you have to not 
equivocate whatsoever. Right. <laughs> yeah. well, one of these stories also involves an arsonist, and I was interested to learn that apparently you know a lot about starting fires, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like what chemical compounds burn hottest and how to create airflow to fuel the flames, etc. Now, I'm hoping that this is just the result of very, very thorough research on your part, but should we be suspicious? <laughs> Even as a child, I didn't play with matches, yeah, so good we're boy. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, no, I learned a lot of years ago that if you make an error in a book, you're gonna. there's people reading you who do everything in there. And uh-huh. if you make a gun error, you'll get a lot of mail about oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you make an error about how a fire is set and how it moves through a warehouse, anything like that, you'll get a letter from firemen. You get a letter from somebody, not from arsonists generally. Oh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> somebody will write and say you made a mistake, and it's mortifying. Yeah. Then you have to, I felt always obligated to write them back and apologize. <laughs> and I really hated writing those apologies. So then, Early, fairly early in my career, I started doing more and more and more research, which meant I started reading less for pleasure. But then the strangest thing happened. I began to love the research. Mm-hmm. And the deeper I got into a subject and the more I learned, the more fun I had with that. So now I research heavily for every yeah. book, but I enjoy it. I read somewhere that I, I guess when you're writing, your computer doesn't have internet access. So do you Google when you research or do you, st- are you old fashioned? Do you have encyclopedias? I have a do? lot of books. Yeah. And every time I see a book on a very esoteric subject, uh-huh. I think, why on earth would I ever write about that? But I buy it anyway. And just so <laughs> oh. I have something like 100,000 books in our library. Wow. And it's full of very bizarre books, but very interesting knowledge. But I go online, just not in my office. Uh, I, I recognize I'm an obsessive personality. <laughs> so if I go online, I'm going to waste endless hours every day. Mm-hmm. So I, the only time I go online is I have used to have two assistants. Uh, one was my brother-in-law who passed, but, and he was very good. And I, their office, they had online. They're online, both of them. And so I would go down there and say, look, I need to, you to go to Google Street find this, 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 and that. I'll be back in an hour. And then he would find it. We'd go through that. Or if there were some things I couldn't get by books, I'd tell him what I wanted. He'd, he'd develop the search string. He'd go look for it, print it out, then I've got it. So I had backup, essentially. Yeah. Now, what do you do with 100,000 books? Do you do you put some in storage, or are they all in your home? Uh, it, there's rooms everywhere with books yeah. in them. So. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm starting to cull them as I oh, yeah. get older. But uh, but as I said, it's odd the things you bought that you think, oh, I'll never use this. And then the day comes when a character starts to speak about something and you go, oh, no. And then you go and find out I have this book about a guy who collected bottle caps or whatever it is. <laughs> and, uh, and it becomes an invaluable piece to help you get through this book. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that you do 60-hour weeks when you're writing a novel. Uh, that's pretty incredible. That's a lot of time spent by yourself in the office. What What is a typical day of writing like for you? I get up at uh, usually 5, uh, shower, okay. uh, and uh, uh, walk the dog, uh, feed her, feed myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm at work by 6.30, and I work straight through to dinner. Uh, and that's six days a week, sometimes seven. Uh, and But when it gets toward the last third of a book, that can get much worse. <laughs> yeah. it, it can start at, I can be getting up at four instead of five, <laughs> go to work for two hours, come back and walk the dog, go back to my office and not have dinner until seven. So I'll be huh. putting in 12-hour days. Um, and Interesting. I do it because... You get into the story in such a deep way. You lose yourself in it. Uh, I have an ocean view from my office. I never see it because the blinds are always down. <laughs> oh, you're uh, kidding. <laughs> I close the windows. They, and I raise the blinds about once a month so the windows can be clean. Um, and when I'm in that cocoon, the world of the story becomes much more vivid. And the hour by hour, now if it's a bad day and it's coming at a snail's pace, you want to get up and beat your head in the wall. But mm-hmm. uh, but may, mainly if you stay with it, uh, you might have a few bad hours in a day. And then you break through at some point and it starts to move and it starts to come more smoothly. 
And so I just find the long hours is the way that works for me. Yeah, and I know that you've been married to the same woman from a very young age. Uh, does it take a special kind of partner to be pretty understanding about those kind of hours and that kind of obsessiveness? I, th I think absolutely yeah. it does. Uh, our offices are side by side oh, yeah. off a of little foyer, so we come in and out of each other's office very easily. Um, she works almost as much as I do. Her background is in accounting and okay. uh, and I'm terrible with the numbers. <laughs> I haven't had to write a check or balance a checkbook since I've been married, and that's heaven to me. <laughs> so she takes care of all that sort of thing. And there was 14 years I was without an agent because I got frustrated with agents. And she set up new agents all over for foreign languages huh. and handled all that submission. That is a lot of work. Wow. And uh, so uh, we both kind of... You know, we're, we're very similar. We have the same tastes in architecture and interior design mm -hmm. and, and fiction and <laughs> everything. It's odd that we met, I, I think, sometimes, uh, and I'm, but I'm grateful we did. Now, you live in Orange County, California, and set many of your novels there. In fact, several stories in Nameless are set in Southern California, and one of them set in La Jolla, which is kind of almost Orange County. It's funny because in my mind— I think of Orange County as a highly sanitized version of life where, you know, nothing bad ever happens. And I'm curious what it is about it that you think makes for such a good setting for horror, suspense and mayhem. Uh, I do set some nameless. One of them is in Michigan and and I, he bounces around mm -hmm. and he'll bounce around more yeah, than Texas. The future. Yeah. yeah. And Jane Hawk novels were all over the place. Sure. But, but there's something about a very dark setting or a very dark story set in a very bright place uh, with palm trees swaying and everything <laughs> else that contrasts the elements of the story with the environment in which it happens. Evil is everywhere, uh, and sometimes we tend to forget that, and we think uh, we lose track that, uh, that evil is uh, at hand in, in an environment, not just... In, in, a, in a grungy city street or something. Mm -hmm. It can happen anywhere. And I like that contrast, plus which I research so much else that a lot of times it, I like not researching the location because I know okay. it. I live in it, so <laughs> I don't have to go to Google Street and I don't have to call people up who live in that city that are on my help Rolodex. I get a lot of people who say... Uh, I do this. for. Um, I work for th this company, and I'm in charge of this for it, and my specialty this. If you ever need knowledge about this, here's my card. So I have a Rolodex that I resort to from time to time. Oh, what if a there's great something, resource. Yeah, if I can't find it anywhere, I can call that person and say, okay, you, you open this door, and now talk to me about this. Wow. And that's helpful. And as with many of your novels, uh, dogs figure heavily into several scenes in Nameless. I know that you've also been involved with Canine Companions for Independence and are a big dog lover. How many dogs do you have now? We have one at a time. Oh, uh, one at a time? Okay, that's yeah. probably smart. <laughs> we were working with Canine Companions for mm -hmm. many years. It provides assistant dogs for people with severe disabilities. And mainstreams, you know, these people who couldn't mm -hmm. before live alone now can. And and it's they provide dogs for children with autism that take away the meltdown situations and the bad behavior just by the relationship. And it's very amazing what they do. And we had worked with them for many years, and they kept saying, take a release dog, one that either doesn't make it through the 24 months of training or that makes it through but has some sort of physical problem and has to come out of service. And we kept saying, well, we're too busy, we're too busy. And I said to Jurda, my wife, one day, we're going to be 90 saying we're too busy. Let's <laughs> just say yes. And it was the best thing we ever did. We took the first one in, and she was with us for nine years. That was Trixie, then Anna, and now Elsa's been with us for three and a half years. And every single golden retriever is the dearest, sweetest mm -hmm. creature, loving but every single one of them has their own personality, just yeah. like human beings. Yeah. It's fun to get to know them. Yeah, my wife and I have a golden retriever named Duncan, and uh, they're just the sweetest dogs. They don't seem to have a mean bone in their body, no. unless another dog walks by. <laughs> <laughs> and only, it's funny, only when only when a dog walks by the house. I see we take him out for a walk, and 
somehow the same dog that he was so upset at when it walked by his house doesn't even phase him when they cross each other on the street. <laughs> they, you know, sometimes that's my territory. Yeah, I'll yeah. never forget our first golden. We, we go to dinner with our dog almost every night. Oh, yeah. Take out and go to patios where they take dogs. Mm. And uh, food has to be good, but the number one criterion is <laughs> can the dog come? And uh, we were in a restaurant with Trixie, our first dog, and we'd been out with her few hundred times and she never barked she never barked except once in the whole time we had her uh, they're trained to be quiet and she was uh, in this restaurant and suddenly this dog walked by way across the street um, and she saw this dog and she started barking and her hackles went up and it was ferocious and we'd never heard it bark and she sounded like an attack dog and I had to quiet her quiet her get her down and we're on the patio and I I said to people, I'm so sorry. This never happened before. Believe me, she's never barked like this. We were on Balboa Island uh, in, mm. in the harbor down yeah. there. And one of the AR diners said, she's totally right. That dog is a dangerous dog. Huh. And it's bitten a number of people. And the wow. authorities won't do anything about it because of who owns it. Wow. And I went, how interesting. The dog knew from clear across the street and was telling it, stay away from here. That is interesting. Yeah. Wow. The the dog has an instinct for <laughs> abuse of power. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot more smarts in dogs yeah. than, than we think. Yeah. And in Nameless, uh, your hero, if we want to call him our anti-hero, targets uh, a serial killer, child rapist, abusers. And I know that you've spoken before about abuse in your own family when you were growing up. Do you think that's probably why you're drawn to stories like these of someone defending the helpless and taking down those who abuse their power? That certainly is an element of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always been an element in my work. It's uh, Some people say, whoa, you write about some pretty dark things. And then I'll get mail from somebody who has ha never heard what my childhood was like until suddenly, that, that, but they've been big readers in my book. And then they'll read some little thing about my childhood and they'll write me and say, I know now why I love your books because they're about the true darkness in life, but they're full of hope. And that's mm. because you got out of that life and you found a way okay. to live that broke from your past. And a lot of these letters, as I'll say, I'm 50 years old and I still suffer from that, from the alcoholism that my parents had and the violence and the beating and the all of that, and how do you get from where you were to where you are now? You obviously are an optimistic person, and I am. And uh, I've said to him that it was somewhere around late teenage, I had this sort of revelation that you could let this guy, my father, color your whole life, or you couldn't. And if you, if you let it color your whole life, the bastard won. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't let it color your wife, you didn't win. Hmm. And that is a serious moment to break yeah. from. And I, I say to him, just think about it. Do you really want him to re or them to ruin your whole life? You don't, so you have to get past mm -hmm. it. And it can be, it sounds simple, but I think it can sometimes be that easy. Yeah, wow. Now, do you put a lot of yourself into your novels, or do you feel like you put a lot of yourself in there? You know, sometimes you know you're putting something in there that's how you feel about things. Mm -hmm. Well, you're always doing that. Yeah. But a lot of the times you put things into them it doesn't cross your mind that this has anything to do with you. The biggest example I can get for that is I wrote a novel called The, the City. And I, it's a story about a, a boy his mo and his mother, a grandfather and a father. And the father is kind of worthless. The grandfather is a jewel and his mother is a jewel. He's 57 years old when the novel opens. And at the behest of his best friend, he's telling you about something that happened between the ages of 9 and 13. And he's a black musician. And I wrote this novel, which I've gotten a lot of mail from readers about. And I had a, I w it was very emotional time writing the novel. I got verklempt all the way through the novel. I'd be sitting there and all of a sudden I'd just lose it. And I finished the novel, sent it to my editor. And she came back and said, I don't want anything done in this except one edition at the end. There's a big dramatic sequence. I want the mother to come back from her. She's a lounge singer. I want her to come back and be in that scene. And I said, but she can't be. She has no excuse to be there. 
anything I did to bring her there, it would be false. But I knew what the editor wanted. She wanted the emotional thing of the mother being in that moment where the son could have lost everything Mm -hmm. at the age of 11 or 13 or whatever he is in that scene. He's already lost a lot. He's in a wheelchair. And, um, but, I realized what she wanted was that moment, the mother to be there as close to when that happened as possible. So I said, well, the police are called into this scene and they would call the mother and she could show up almost at the moment everything finally resolves. And I said, I can write that. And my wife said, don't write it. It's it's right the way it is. I wrote a page and a half and we were eating at home that night. And she was cooking. I hadn't sent it to the editor yet. And I said, I want to read this mother entering to you. I couldn't read it. I'd break down every time I tried to read wow. it. And I'm not a guy who cries all the time, but I <laughs> I started to, I had to leave the room three or four times. I finally came back and finished reading it. I said, I don't know why this book has been such an emotional, it's just been a, a terrible emotional experience for me. She looked at me and said, it's because it's about you and your mother. Huh. And I looked at her with an absolute stun and it was. And I had never been able to write about that relationship until I made it a character who wasn't a writer but a musician, who wasn't white but black. I gave him the same family, the same mother, but I separated him into another culture. Then Mm -hmm. I researched it, the music and everything, and his grandfather had been a big band pianist. And and, uh, uh, then I was able to write about me and my mother. (laughs) And I hadn't recognized it all the way through the book. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> now, before we go, can you tell us a little bit about your next novel, which uh, I think is the first in this Amazon deal called Devoted, right? Yeah. Devoted comes out March 31st. It's hardcover, uh, eventually trade paperback, ebook, of course, and audio. And it's about a woman who's widowed and her, her 11-year-old autistic son who has never spoken a word in his 11 years. And the villain in it is a man who is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company who's doing research into longevity, and they're researching it in a strange and interesting way. And something goes so wrong in the labs that he personally pushes his button to destruct them and kills everybody in the lab, but he gets out. And whatever he tried to destroy in the lab, he's contaminated with, and something is happening to him. And he's on his way to this widow and her child. The child, meanwhile, this is all in the very opening, so I'm giving nothing away. Okay. The child knows that it believes that his father did not die in an accident but was murdered. And he's a savant, uh, autistic savant, and has been researching this on the web and has gotten into the dark web where there's murder for hard types, and they have known that he's looking for them. So the mother and the son are suddenly at this locus where all this evil is coming at them. And the, as it as it falls upon the boy, uh, he's he's in a state of terror that he's never been before. And we've also met these dogs who are smarter than <laughs> dogs. Of course, they're very smart dogs, and they don't understand where they came from or what <laughs> they are, but they know they're out there, and they correspond with each other telepathically just like flocks of birds change directions Mm -hmm. because they have a telepathy element, or elephants come from great distance when one of them dies because Mm -hmm. they know. Uh, These dogs have that, but much stronger. And they call it the wire. They can speak to each other on the wire. And they call themselves the Mysterium because they don't know why they're out there or how many of them there are. And one day this dog hears a voice on the wire, and it's this boy, and he's never heard the thoughts of a human being before. Oh, wow. And it's not that out there a novel. It's pretty much realistic in the way it's handled. And what happens then, all this is in the setup. So that's what the novel's about. Exciting stuff. Something to look forward to. It's called yes. Devoted, by the way. Because oh, the Devoted, yeah. The dog and the boy and the mother, they're all devoted to one Okay. Another. Well, in the meantime, Nameless is available for free to Prime and Kindle Unlimited members. Dean Coons, thanks for talking with me. Thanks. It was easy. You're easy to talk to. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again to Dean Kuntz for coming on the podcast. His collection of short stories titled Nameless is available for free to Prime and Kindle Unlimited members. Keep up with him at deankuntz.com and on Twitter at at Dean Kuntz. 
Today's episode is brought to you by Kronos. Kronos provides HR solutions for the modern workforce and the people who support, motivate, and engage them. They put HR, payroll, talent, and timekeeping on a single cloud-based platform. Learn more about Kronos HR, payroll, talent, and time at kronos.com slash hrswagger. That's kronos.com slash hrswagger. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and rate and review us while you're there. Five-star ratings and detailed reviews are one of the best ways for new listeners to discover the show. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at at KickAssNewsPod and recommend us to your friends on your social media. For more fun stuff, visit KickAssNews.com and I welcome your comments, questions, and suggestions at comments at KickAssNews.com. For now, I'm Ben Mathis, and thanks for listening to Kick-Ass News. <laughs>